Okay, so confession before we start, this is actually take two. Uh, it didn't record this morning and we just felt it was important for those of you who watch on catch up um, that you could have the word as well. So you won't hear anyone laughing at my jokes, but I promise you this morning they did. So we're continuing our series today looking at Psalm 42, such a beautifully perfect, um, poetic psalm. The psalm says at the beginning that it was by the sons of Korah. And just to give you a little background before we delve into the psalm, in the Bible the term sons can also mean descendants rather than direct sons. So the sons of Korah were descendants of Moses' cousin Korah. And you can read about Korah in number 16, but the quick version is that he opposed Moses, and not only that, he managed to get 250 men on his side to stand against Moses and Aaron, questioning their decisions and leadership. But the Lord had placed Moses and Aaron in charge, and so ultimately Korah and his group were questioning God, and who knows that rebellion against God is a wrong path to go down. So much so that they ended up, some of them being swallowed up by the earth and the others were consumed by fire. I'll leave you to work out your own lessons about respect and leadership there. But thankfully, Korah's three actual sons were not included in that ordeal. And in fact, in the list of descendants that came from them, we have the prophet Samuel, as you can read about in 1 Chronicles and 1 Samuel. Some descendants went on to be doorkeepers of the tabernacle. Some were warriors alongside David. And then we have these descendants who seem to have musical ability in pen 11 of the Psalms. In fact, one of the descendants was said to be the leader of David's choir. So this experience written about in this Psalm might have even been David's story that they put music to. So looking at Psalm 42, if you've got your Bibles with you this morning, shall we turn and read it together? If you were in church in the 80s, you'll understand my struggle not to sing right now. As the deer pants for the streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. Where can I go and meet with God? My tears have been my food day and night. While people say to me all day long, where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I used to go to the house of God under the protection of the Mighty One, with shouts of joy and praise among the festive throng. Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? But your hope in God, or I will yet praise him, my Saviour and my God. My soul is downcast within me. Therefore I remember you from the land of Jordan, the heights of Hermon, from Mount Mazar. Deep calls to deep in the roar of your waterfalls, all your waves and breakers have swept over me. By day the Lord directs his love, at night his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. I say to God my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why must I go about mourning, oppressed by the enemy? My bones suffer mortal agony as my foes taunt me, saying to me all day long, where is your God? Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my saviour and my God. So the psalmist here seems to go on a roller coaster of emotions from being really down and depressed to then speaking to himself and bringing hope. Reading this, I realise that thankfully I'm not the only one who speaks to themselves, which is a relief. But there is this biblical principle behind it. As we live on earth, we have this dual conflict between our flesh life and our inner man, our spirit. And this is really played out in this psalm. It's the voice of someone who believes in and loves the Lord God, but is under a depression, struggling with doubts and fears, but looking for the presence of God, holding on by faith of what has gone before and hope of what is yet to come. I think that's why of all the books in the Bible, the Psalms is believed to be one of the most read and most quoted books. There's a vulnerability about what is written. There are emotions that we might very well identify with. It's raw, it's honest. It's someone's feelings poured out on the pages. So let's have a closer look at this passage together. Verses 1 and 2 are very well-known verses and are such beautiful imagery. As a deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. Thirsting speaks of a desperation. 
We know that the human body is made up of 55 to 60% water. We can live for a few weeks without food. Well, I can't, but apparently people can. But without water, a person starts to dehydrate. And because your body has trouble maintaining its blood pressure, your organs begin to shut down and you can't survive more than four days. Water is essential. In the NLT translation, it says of Psalm 42, As the deer longs for streams of water, so I long for you, O God. So this thirst, this desperation, is something the psalmist longs after. If you long after something, you need it. You tend to value it, place high importance on it. If we value it, something, we give it our time. We may give it our finances. We tend to talk about it a lot. I wonder what people would say about you and about me. What is obviously important to us? Hopefully the Lord would be top on your list. But when is it that we thirst for God? When do we chase after him? Is it when things are well, when we are happy and content with life? Or is it when life is hard, when we've come to the end of ourselves, our resources, when we've got nothing left, and then we say, I need you, Lord. Life can be hard. Life can be draining. You see people nowadays walking around with their water bottles ready to refill themselves because they understand the importance of keeping hydrated. I wonder if we place as much importance on keeping filled with our life source, the living water that Jesus offers to us, the spirit from whom we can draw strength, guidance, comfort, direction, peace, joy, and so much more. It's there for us, but do we remember to spiritually hydrate? I guess during tough times, then I'm suddenly more focused, then I'm more about leaning into God. And over these next verses, we read that the psalmist is obviously going through a difficult time. In verse 3, he goes on to describe his despair, those tears that have been ongoing when he can't even eat. In verse 4, we read the psalmist remembering the good old days when they led people to the temple to worship. And now they are no longer in Jerusalem. They are obviously being taunted by their enemies. Where is your God now? Many theologians believe this is referring to David when he had to flee from his son Absalom. David took his family and his officials with him out of Jerusalem, leaving the Ark of the Covenant behind. So there's this terrible sadness at remembering when he used to be able to worship freely in the temple. And throughout the remaining verses, we have the switching between hope and despair, verses of lament, and then the hope, like an emotional roller coaster. Anyone ever identify with that experience? I'd like to think I'm getting a bit more emotionally stable as I deepen in my love and trust for the Lord. But if you want to see a roller coaster of emotions, just live with a teenager for a while. Well, an hour is probably enough. But we all experience it at times, I'm sure. There are lots of occasions in the Psalms where this sadness pours through, where the psalmist asks, Where are you, God? Why aren't you getting rid of my enemies? Why is my soul downcast? The psalmist doesn't think of the human soul in the same way we do today. The word translated soul is the Hebrew word nephash, and it literally means throat or breath, but it's used to describe our life force, a person's whole being. These were real people going through real life with real tough times. And I'm sure we've had times when we can identify with the psalmist in their lament. Sometimes in church services, we are quick to praise and give testimony of where God came through for us. And it's absolutely important we should do those things. But we can give the impression, if we're not careful, that we're living a life that is always good. And so when others face difficult situations, they think, well, I can't tell anyone about this because it must just be me. Everyone else's life is great. Maybe I don't have enough faith. Maybe I'm not far enough along in my walk with the Lord. Maybe I haven't read my Bible enough or prayed for long enough. Maybe it was because I did that thing in my past and the Lord hasn't really forgiven me for it. And we start on a line of incorrect thinking that actually takes us further away from the Lord and his people. You know, I have testimonies of miracles in my life and I've shared some, but... 
I'd like to think I always balance it up with my shortcomings, with times I've failed or with times when life has been hard and I've struggled. I'll be the first to admit that I find life really hard sometimes. I battle with anxiety and worry. I battle with feelings of loneliness and insecurity about various things. There are times when I've literally had to drag myself to church and all I could manage to do was to sit there. The psalmist wrote, I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why must I go about mourning, oppressed by the enemy? There are times when God has felt so far away and I'm thinking, why can't I hear you? Where are you in this situation? Just what is going on here? When Jesus was stripped naked, beaten to within an inch of his life, nailed to that wooden cross, his onlookers scorning him, Even Jesus himself at one point cries out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus, in his humanity, understands the despair of feeling abandoned by God. Sometimes we can feel like everything bad in life has hit us at once, as verse 7 puts it. Deep calls to deep in the roar of your waterfalls. All your waves and breakers have swept over me. The sons of Korah, along with David, felt as if recurring waves of trouble had plunged their souls into a bottomless ocean of sorrow and despair. Jonah Jonah also felt the same in Jonah 2, 3, where we read of similar language used to describe his predicament when he disobeyed God. You hurled me into the depths, into the very heart of the seas, and the current swirled about me. All your waves and breakers swept over me. I first spoke in Revive Church around Christmas time 2019 downstairs and I mentioned how situation after situation was falling upon me. My mum, diagnosed with a cancerous brain tumour, was deteriorating quickly at this stage. My new job had been taken from under my feet with restructuring, which meant a new manager and team and a few other issues were going on at the same time. And I felt so alone that one day I just crawled under my desk and cried. I was in an office on my own, just to point out. But I said at the time that it's okay not to be okay. And me sharing that gave a couple of people in the room that chance to open up honestly about their feelings with various situations that day. And I felt again today to repeat that it's okay not to be okay. There may be someone this morning who needs to know that they can stop trying to press down those emotions. If you need to continue to grieve someone or something, you can do that. If you're feeling sad, lonely, depressed, anxious, disappointed, maybe even angry, this is a safe space where you can be real and be able to start to work through those feelings. These feelings, when they come, they don't make you weak or a bad Christian. What is important to do, what the psalmist did in this situation though, because he had a personal relationship with the living God, he knew he needed to look for the Lord, to invite him into his pain. Many people in the world turn to all sorts of other things, usually to mask the pain or emotions, things like alcohol or drugs, excessive exercise or the other extreme of eating. Maybe they throw themselves into work or into family or binge watching a box set anything for distraction. The enemy, the devil, would love to keep you in that state also, adding to feelings of despair and helplessness. Let's face it, most of the battles that take place are in our minds. Now, it might be that you need to talk to a professional and receive support, and I'm not dismissing sensible forms of help, so please hear me on that. However, it is important that we start that honest dialogue with the Lord. It's then that he can show you he is there and start to bring about a healing work. Some people turn away from God at these points in life and maybe even blame him. This is where you need to, like the psalmist, have a conversation with yourself. Where our inner man needs to have a conversation with our flesh so that we don't go inside our own heads, don't listen to all the lies and instead let our spirit speak truth. That's why Paul tells us to take captive every thought. The psalmist stopped listening to himself and started talking to himself. 
This sense of deep calling to deep, I love, that no matter how low we get, even if we hit rock bottom, we can call out to God and he will meet us there. Psalm 139 says, Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me, your right hand will hold me fast. Even back then, they knew the Lord was the solution, the one who could rescue them. They didn't even have what we have now. Since then, the Messiah came to earth, died for us, taken our place so that we can live in the freedom of forgiveness. We can have God literally living on the inside of us through the Holy Spirit. What a power and resource we have dwelling within us to help us be overcomers. A well-known Christian speaker said, There is a place of deep anointing, deep presence and deep intimacy with God Almighty, where deep calleth unto deep, or spirit calls unto spirit. It is a place that is so pure that every part of your being is consumed by the presence of Almighty God. Your soul is stirred, and there is a breakthrough in the spirit as deep calleth unto deep. We need to lift our eyes off of our circumstances and situations and place them on the Lord. Whilst we acknowledge when we are down or sad or really going through the mill, at the same time, we need to run to the arms of our Father who can literally carry us through until we're ready to walk again side by side with him. So how can we do that? Well, the psalmist's faith reasons with his fears, his hope argues with his sorrows. Verse 5, why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my saviour and my God. So a good place to start is to sit and listen to worship music. I know when I'm in a place where I have nothing left to give and can't even pray, then I put on some worship or a Christian radio station and let it minister to me. Lyrics such as, even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop working. Or, good, good Father, it's who you are. And great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. And your plans are still to prosper. You've not forgotten us. You're with us in the fire and the flood. And we sang it last week. I know the night won't last, your word will come to pass. My heart will sing your praise again. Your promise still stands, great is your faithfulness. This is my confidence, you never failed. Plenty of other songs, I'm sure, have come to your mind, literally our own modern day psalms. And by playing worship, it starts to remind me of God's character and the truth in the word which brings hope. Often worship songs contain lines from or are based upon scripture and it is this that speaks to our flesh to line up with our spirit. Your heart starts to erupt as your worship lines up with the Holy Spirit and you become aware of his awesome presence and your spirit begins to fellowship with him. Another thing the psalmist does is remembers time pass with the Lord. So a good thing to do is to think back, remember when you've seen the Lord at work and have seen him bring you or others through. When he says in verse 8, by day the Lord directs his love, at night his song is with me, I wonder if he's remembering the Israelites being freed from captivity of the Egyptians where God led them by a pillar of cloud by day and fire by night. You might have a prayer journal or diary which you can look back through to remind yourself of the goodness of God in your life over the years. Little times when he's poured out favour and blessings upon you. And when you remember those times, you can't help but be thankful and filled with a hope that if he got you through them, he can get you through now. Like the psalmist, start preaching to yourself. Thirdly, don't isolate yourself. In the natural, when I'm struggling, I just want to hide, to not see or speak to anyone. But we were made for community, and that doesn't mean posting it all over social media, but we need to reach out to a trusted friend or two. Choose wisely who you seek comfort and counsel from. The last thing you need is a Job's comforter, someone who ends up making you feel worse than when you started. Find someone you know will love you through, someone who won't try to fix you, but will sit by your side, listen to you when you want to talk, 
and be praying into your situation on your behalf. It's also good for you to still look out for those around you who need help. It might not always be appropriate at this stage, but if you are able to serve others, then that helps us remember that we are part of something bigger and we were made for more than ourselves. Definitely keep coming to church. Just being in the presence of fellow believers who are able to praise and pray can lift your soul and, of course, you can receive help and support here. Fourthly, we can read scriptures to remind us of who God is, of who we are in him, and thus regain that sense of hope and trust. Romans 16 reminds us that the final victory will be ours through Christ Jesus, as it says in verse 20, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The Lord might have us wait for a while as we wait for our answer, and we may have certain tested periods we go through, but be clear in your mind about what is God and what is the devil at work, or happening just because we live in a fallen world. God is pure love and abhors sickness and disease. Death wasn't part of his original plan for us. If you have a warped sense of who God is, then it will be hard to trust him. It would be a good idea to memorise some Bible verses or stick some up so you can encourage yourself in the word. Verses like these shown in the video. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and kind in all his works. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desire of those who fear him. He also hears their cry and saves them. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and those who are crushed in spirit. The righteous person may have many troubles, but the Lord delivers him from them all. Those who trust in the Lord will find new strength. They will soar high on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary, and they will walk and not faint. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favour and honour. No good thing does he withhold from those whose walk is blameless. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned, and the flames will not set you ablaze. The Lord is good, a refuge in times of trouble. He cares for those who trust in him. Give your burdens to the Lord, and he will protect you. He will not permit the godly to slip and fall. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run to it and are safe. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those called according to his purpose. And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. Because of the Lord's great love for us, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. And so on and so on. There's a whole book of them. Thank you to those lovely people who took time to record that. I really appreciate it. Remembering scripture is particularly helpful for when most people really tend to suffer. In the middle of the night when you can't sleep and you lay awake. And you know, that's when the mind can be at its worst. When thoughts are as dark as the night surrounding you. It's then that you need to meditate on God's word on a scripture. 
Get to know God through his word so that you understand who he is and who you are in him so that you understand promises and benefits that you can claim over and in your life. Psalm 1611 tells us that in his presence there is fullness of joy. Everything else might give you temporary happiness. We may feel better for a while, but it can't sustain us with peace and joy like the Lord can. It's that inner feeling we can have that even when our circumstances are dire, even if nothing else changes externally, once we've spent time with God, once we lean into him, cast our care unto him, then internally we'll be transformed and ready to carry on and face whatever situation, but in his strength, knowing he's battling with and for us. Finally, after I've done all the above steps, I usually find God was right where he said he was. When my enemies cry out, where is your God? Hebrews 13 tells us, God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. Yes, he's been there all along. And so I can begin praying again, simply talking to God, giving him my fears, my woes, my worries and concerns, and trusting that he is working in the background. He does have a plan for my life. He loves me immensely. He can do immeasurably more than I can hope or ask, that nothing is too difficult for him. See where learning those Bible verses comes in handy? I can remind him of his own words and promises and let him take over the situation. I can allow his spirit to minister to my spirit, remembering that he left his Holy Spirit to be our guide, our counsellor, our helper, our teacher, our comforter, who, when we are too weak, will intercede for us, is a source of revelation, wisdom and power, gives us fruit and gifts to equip us with everything we need. In my pain and angst, I can still be obedient to God, still praise him, still bless and serve others, still come and serve in church, still pray for others in their situations, and still recognize and be thankful for what the Lord has done for me. Someone said, although the psalmist speaks openly with God about his feelings, he also declares his determination to hope in God. He fully believes that while things are not great at the moment, because God is great, restoration is always right around the corner, even if it doesn't always fit in with our timelines. He knew the future belonged to God and that he would make all things right in his timing. That is why the psalmist was able to say, I will yet praise him. Jesus has overcome this world and is returning for us with the fullness of his redemption coming with him. Jesus makes it clear in John 16, 33, when he tells his disciples, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome this world. And this sets an example for us as to how we should respond to things going bad in our lives even when they're bad, to the point that they look as if God has forgotten us. Hope in God. Wait for him to act to help you. You can be assured that you will yet again praise him. And if things get their absolute worst in this life, you know that this isn't the end. We have a glorious future in store for us. I hope you understand this morning that I'm not saying this is a quick fix strategy that you need to rush through your feelings to get to victory. This won't be anything new to many of you. You may not be able to do all of those things that I've mentioned at once. You may need us to pray with you. You may need to speak to Hannah or Gareth. You may, as I've said, need professional counselling and support. But please take it from one who knows, from one who's gone through it and will continue to go through it, I'm sure. Cling to God, the rock of our salvation, the anchor in times of trouble, and allow him to meet you where you are at, even in the depths, so that he can go through this with you. You may have to walk by faith and not by sight and trust, but isn't it great to know that even though we go through the same things the world does, we have a faithful, loving God who is on our side, who we can put our hope in, knowing he will get us through, so that we can say with the psalmist, put your hope in God, 
for I will yet praise him, my saviour and my God. You might want to listen to a song sung by Philippa Hannah called You're Still God. I played it this morning and if you're having a difficult time right now or maybe you can think of things previously that you've not dealt with, why don't you just play that and ask the Lord to just minister to you right now. Just start to open up with him and let him bring his healing into your life.